Uh, welcome everyone to the distracted group meeting this evening. Uh, first of all, I just want to sign the minutes off of the meeting held on the 9th of March. I'd be happy to do so. Great, thank you. I've received apologies tonight for uh, cancelling charges, not that I've approved that he wants to put the apologies in. I've had apologies that Wayne Howard is unlikely to be here. In fact, Mike's just arrived. It's one of the problems with Mike right this fight today. Well done, Mike. Sorry, Mike. That's okay. Give some time. Okay. Some time. Okay. Uh, Wayne Howard uh, is going to try and get here for Vernon, but it's been held up, so he may not get here. So, no, apologies. Are there any more apologies from anyone? No, thank you. No, okay, thank you. The next item is declarations of members' interests. Are they no, not now? Please declare them as and when during the meeting. So the first substantive item tonight is on the strategic planning issues. Uh, biodiversity supplementary planning document, uh, Councillor James. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the biodiversity supplementary planning document went out for consultation. Uh, it was an eight-week consultation rather than the usual six weeks going to the Christmas break. Um, there have been uh, several uh, responses to it uh, with, with suggestions. One or two of the responses uh, suggested matters which are a little bit beyond the scope of this uh, SPD. Um, apart from a, a couple of additions, about 98% or so of this document is similar to the Northamptonshire uh, SPD, Biodiversity uh, SPD, adopted by the North Northamptonshire <coughs> What has been suggested is that a protected species uh, survey be introduced, a back survey, for all buildings with slate roofs and agricultural buildings with exposed beams. And I think that is a reasonable requirement if we are to protect that species. Apart from that, uh, there are, are no controversial issues, amendments or, or, or alterations. So I propose that this biodiversity SPD be adopted. The proposed changes are highlighted in the appendix A, yes. I think. Go to some us why the slate roof. What's the uh, Perhaps like it. Perhaps like Sir Cruz then. I don't know. the question. Are there any uh, questions or comments from members of the committee or anyone else? No. So we've got two recommendations. Are you happy to agree with both? Agree. 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 Right, next item is the Bouts and Village Design Statement. Before I hand over to Councillor James on this, I just want to say that obviously I've been circulating to all members of the strategy brief um, a submission from um, uh, Phil Paulson Planning about a particular position they wanted to, for you to consider tonight regarding the Village Design Statement. And also, I've equally circulated um, a, a message from the Parish Council about their position on this. Uh, my understanding is the approach starts due down here this evening. Uh, so I was going to suggest we kick off with Councillor James as the portfolio holder, and I would ask Councillor Shepherd, who's the local member for Bowden, and he might want to start the debate up. So on that note, uh, Councillor James. Thank you, Chairman. The Bowden Village design statement was put out uh, for consultation. <laughs> there were two responses to the consultation. Uh, some good suggestions in it, some uh, perhaps we didn't uh, agree with. Um, it's important to note that this is a village design statement, the purpose of which is to guide and inform. It's not a neighbourhood plan, it's not a parish plan. And that matters affecting uh, any planning application which might come forward in respect of uh, Bantam Village uh, would be a matter for the planning committee to consider in conjunction with the various supplementary planning documents, the core strategic plan, and the part two local plan uh, when it emerges. So its purpose is to guide and inform. Now, 
Uh, one of the consultations was from Jill Pawson Planning, and I feel it's only fair in the interest of uh, transparency and due process to read the letter out in case members uh, have forgotten the contents thereof in the part and in the whole. Uh, so it's a letter from Jill Pawson Planning to members of Danbury District Council Strategy Group about the village design statement. At your forthcoming meeting on 13th of April, you are due to consider a report advising the adoption of the Bowden Village Design Statement, BVDS. As you will be aware, I made comments on the draft document on behalf of a local landowner. I am pleased to see that many of the comments have been accepted in the report and are due to be incorporated into the final document. However, there is one point of principle and two points of detail where I dispute the conclusions in the report. These are as follows. Point of principle. In my representation, I challenge the role of a village design statement as a supplementary planning document, SPD. In the National Planning Policy Framework in the report, it states supplementary planning documents Documents which add further detail to the policies in the local plan. They can be used to provide further guidance for development on specific sites or on particular issues such as design. To show compliance with the NPPF, the report states that the district has an up-to-date local plan. However, the West Northamptonshire Joint Core Strategy only sets out strategic policies and does not deal with planning in and around villages. Therefore, the council is preparing its settlements and countryside local plan to set out up-to-date village planning policies. The VDS relies on references to the old local plan and the saved policies, which are out of date and no longer comply with national policy. These will soon be replaced. Therefore, it is premature to consider adopting the BVDS as SPD. The BVDS should be agreed and finalised, but not at this stage adopted by the Council as SPD. This would give the opportunity for the BVDS to be updated once the new local plan has been adopted. It could then be adopted as SPD as it would then add further detail to policies in the local plan. Point of detail one, in my representation, I pointed out that a small open space within the village cannot contribute to giving, to the giving a sense of proximity to the countryside. This point has not been properly addressed in your report and needs to be reconsidered before the document <coughs> is finalised. Point of detail two, the views into and across the small open space within the village are very limited, confined to users of the foot <coughs> along spring close. These very local views should not be given the same status as views into and out of the village, which are of wider public benefit. It is accepted that the field contributes to the setting of the church, but in a separate submission, this contribution has been found by an independent expert to be modest and capable of being retained without needing to designate the whole field as an important open space. Therefore, there is no justification for including the small open space in the section on views and on important open spaces. Now, if I may make a number of points, and then I'll leave it open to our members. First of all, the same policies of the local plan, uh, weight can still be added to those. This has already been proved. 
challenged by the Court of Appeal decision that we, it may be a modest weight, but weight can still be afforded to those until the Part 2 plan emerges. The second point is this. The open space referred to, the small field, is a field which I gather is known locally as Jackson's Field, which is a small parcel of land uh, adjoining the church between that and Spring Lane. Um, the consultant here says that it cannot contribute to giving a small open space within the village cannot contribute to giving a sense of, a sense of proximity to the countryside. Now, I'm not an expert on landscape, but I personally I'll dispute that. But members may have some ideas. The second point to it is that this field was identified in the 2003 Barrington Village Design Statement as an open space. Uh, at that time, and in fact I have the document here, and it shows arrows with views in and out <coughs> of that uh, field. Uh, so views both ways. <coughs> so it was obviously considered uh, of merit, of value to that space, in 2003. Consequently, it has been included in the draft SPD, which uh, we're putting, discussing this evening. Um, as to uh, whether those views uh, are, 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 are um, you know, what does he refer to? To be modest, uh, whether those views are modest or not, I don't know. I would have thought there must have been some merit, otherwise they wouldn't have been included in these 2003 uh, design statements. Those are the uh, points that I wish to make, and I'll now leave it open to members to discuss this matter thoroughly before we come to the decision. Actually, Councillor James, I just want to add to my earlier comments. Um, uh, because I was lobbied on this, and obviously I allowed that letter you read to be circulated to all traffic group members here this evening. And then, in fairness, also about the parish council and the clerks right now, also uh, sent an email which I circulated to all traffic group members, so you can see both sides of the argument. I was going to hand over now to Councillor Shepherd, the local member, to go first, sir. Chairman, thank you. Uh, we have two, in fact, sets of representations uh, on which we are uh, copied and summarised in the uh, appendix from Gladman uh, and from Pawson Planning. Certainly, I have uh, no sympathy with the Gladman representations uh, and will not expand anything at all to the comments of officers in respect of that. Um, in relation to the course and planning representations, um, one, one must have some sympathy. Uh, planning is, as we know, a, a matter of balance. Uh, and uh, the arguments uh, on behalf of the landowner, uh, which actually are not uh, particularly addressed here, but I would suggest from a local perspective, the arguments on behalf of the landowner uh, are that uh, this open space. Now, I do like the word valued open space, which is in Jane Perry's uh, Paris, uh, report. I think mean, that's a good phrase. Um, the open space is, is pretty hidden. And certainly driving through Boughton, uh, it would be, uh, well, you wouldn't know that because it's not part of the main road at all. It's, it's behind uh, the, uh, the church. Uh, indeed, walking through Boughton, you would have to be uh, fairly uh, knowledge of about the area, I suppose like me, uh, you regard it as, as important uh, because one has been there a long time and it's, the, the open space has been at the bottom of one's lane for a long time as an open space. Uh, but the, the arguments in favour from the landowner is firstly that it's, it's not uh, an open space that one normally thinks of contributing to, its, to, to a, a village centre like a, uh, a cricket pitch or a village green. Um, and equally, uh, the landowner would say there's not much use for it other than housing. Uh, and when, and that is true, it was agricultural many years ago, uh, but it is such a smaller area now that uh, it is, it is falling into, into disrepair. Having said that, it is still a very open space, I think, in my view. 
Uh, this one, it won a, won a small debate, uh, I recall, the last BDS of Parish Council. This is going back yeah, to 2002, 2003. Uh, there was an argument that uh, supported <coughs> three or four stone houses on the space. Uh, and that argument was generally called the sort of gentrification argument. Uh, it's making, uh, arguably, good use of an area of land that otherwise is justified by expense. Uh, that argument failed. Uh, I wasn't advocating that. It was just an argument that was raised by one particular parish councillor in the 2003 debate. Uh, so there is uh, an argument in favour. But as I said earlier, um, the, uh, the issue in planning is, is all of balance. Uh, and the argument uh, and the debate in 2003, of course, was, was not so much affected also by the external effects or the external relations of Bowson. Uh, well, it's, it's not raised as a, as a matter for officers, from officers, but it is raised locally, which is, of course, that we have 100 houses on one side of Bowson and uh, 1,000 on the other, both within the village. Uh, and uh, the villagers, uh, in, cons in considering any uh, development, uh, cannot ignore that. And I accept it's not directly material necessarily to uh, our, our discussion on this particular aspect of the VDS. But given the limited value, limited importance in, in planning terms of the VDS, given the consistent uh, approach of the Parish Council both in 2003 and, uh, and today, uh, and given that on balance um, uh, it is, I believe, a, a very open space, uh, I'm absolutely content with the officer's advice uh, and invite the um, committee to accept it. Thank you, Councillor Shepherd. Councillor Paul. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, village design statement, supplementary planning document, local plan for the benefit of those that are not on the planning committee. Would it be uh, an idea for one of the officers to give a, a very brief outline uh, of the three, um, the three subjects and also where they fall in the hierarchy. Thank you, Chairman. I just thought for Councillor James to cover that. Sorry? I thought Councillor James to cover that. Yeah, okay. Is that right, okay. right Councillor James? Did you mention mm -hmm. that? Yeah, thank you. Okay, it wasn't me imagining it. That's okay. Sorry, I'll take it. That's okay, that's fine. <coughs> Are there any more comments or questions from committee members? Or all member committee members? Councillor yeah. Wesley. Yeah, just... Uh, Regarding what Councillor Paul has just said, um, I mean, well, I'm right in saying that the, the old save policies are it's ever decreasing weight, isn't it? Is that not right? Um, I'm saying. Uh, Chairman, the simple answer is no. Okay. Um, as we recently found oh, by the Court of Appeal, the save policies still have substantial weight. It would depend on the fact of the matrix, it would depend on their relationship with national policy at the time, but no, it isn't as simple as saying the older they are, the less weighty they are. They can still have substantial weight in many years after adoption. Okay, thank you. Fair question, thank you for that, Councillor Wilson. Any more comments or questions? If not, can we move to the three, four recommendations before you? Uh, you want to, uh, are you happy to support? Agree, agree, agree. Anyone against? Okay, thank you. The first recommendation has uh, gone for it, thank you. And your last item back, Councillor James, is the Community Infrastructure Levy Update. Yes, um, the recommendation before you uh, needs a, a slight alteration, as we now put the spray out in here. Um, the paragraph three of the recommendation, the, center, the final sentence should end at the end of planning fee income, full stop. And the words arising from the proposed 20% fee increase and planning application fees, that needs taking out. Okay. And the reason for that is that we're probably counting that two months before they hatch. I think that's a fair expression as far as that last bit is concerned. Okay. Right. Um, this is an update of the SIL programme. Now that's the first thing to note. Secondly, that the councils have decided to adopt and confirm uh, positions on the SIL discretions. 
using movement, and that we're proposing for an increase in the uh, planning investigation, but uh, an increase in the budget for planning investigation enforcement to be increased by 39,000 for the purposes of ensuring uh, still due to be collected. Now there are good reasons for that because like many taxes there are legal ways of avoiding it and some people don't even like the legal ways of avoiding it and, uh, and there are devious ways of avoiding it which may not be legal. But nevertheless, uh, experience has shown that we have recovered something like £79,000 due to uh, being diligent in investigating still liability. And therefore, it would pay to increase the budget for planning investigation by £39,000, uh, which would be sufficient to fund one full-time investigation. Well, certainly, on the basis, on the evidence before us so far, it would fund itself, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, so, that is something which we're putting forward with this. Right, now let's start on the other side. First of all, the updated SIL program. The basic SIL has not changed since its introduction, although we have been entitled to indexation which has produced a little bit more extra money than uh, we thought. Uh, on the expenditure side, our primary commitment at this moment is 12 million towards the Daventry Development Link Road, which is coming out of the SIL. Um, there is a spreadsheet at the back, which I don't propose to go into too deep, because I think it's more or just department than it is mine. Um, but uh, nevertheless, on the expenditure side, uh, great care needs to be taken. One looks at these big figures and thinks it's money that can be spent. Uh, that may or may not be the case. I don't know. But it wouldn't do to uh, uh, come on that up for any uh, projects at this time without uh, due diligence. What we're proposing on the expenditure side is to move back the provision for town centre car parking because there's no pressing need for that at the present time or possibly in the foreseeable future. The Daventry bus interchange and Daventry to Long Buckby station cycle track are moved back a year and the Daventry Braunston cycle track comes forward a year at a reduced cost of 750000 instead of the 1 million previously envisaged. And a year is added to the development bus services reflecting the longer range of the programme as time the longer range of the programme as time has passed. So that's basic information on the SIL budget and SIL itself. Um, the discretions which we are entitled to adopt, they are shown in the appendix, yeah. table A11. And if you look at that on page 57, you will see that uh, we are proposing one in respect of discretionary charitable relief that this will not apply where the charity uh, is involved in commercial gain. Secondly, uh, discretionary social housing relief will not apply uh, because this relates to housing which is sold at a discount rate rather than being rented. Discretionary relief for exceptional circumstances will not apply. Installments will be applied in accordance with the installments policy. On land payments, we may, may accept land payments on a case-by-case -case basis. And finally, infrastructure payments, we may accept those on a case-by-case -case basis. It's not to say that we will always do it in respect of one or two items. Uh, and that is really all I have to say about oh the future of SIL 
Uh, officers are aware of the history of betterment levels and development against tax and all the rest of it. Uh, so they <coughs> have in mind, given that government is making uh, noises about changes to the SIL program, that uh, we should be very, very careful about going too far into the future and spending money uh, and relying on future receipts because central government could easily let us down mm -hmm. on this one. We're not suggesting it will, but we know from history that they could, they could change in certain ways. Yes, it can always change, so I can't change. Uh, so I would like to put that to our strategy. Uh, Thank you, Steve, Councillor James. I've just got one query here, so it's a long the Do you want to do it, Steve? The well, I, I was about to yeah. do one and two. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor well, Osborne. Thank you. Two, two items, Chairman. First of all, the, the, the town centre car park can be moved back. I can understand that does help. Anything that's <coughs> moved back um, helps preserve seal balances. Um, but I don't understand because there is not yet a pressing need to deliver this. One would think that the high lows and flats that are gone through planning lately, one would think you would need to deliver um, some more town centre car parking. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the other part of it would be um, the long Buffy cycle link. Yeah. I accept again it would preserve the sill balances and I accept that the building, the major building hasn't been developed yet along um, that side of down tree towards Buppy Wharf. But you put your life in your own hands um, that are driving from Long Buppy Wharf um, with yet another a bad smash between the three bridges a couple of weeks ago. Let alone walking and let alone cycling. Because you've got to walk on the road in a 60 mile an hour limit and you've got a bike there. And they knock the bridge down several times a year, the cars do, so it's, it's not exactly safe. So I can see both of them preserving uh, seal balances, um, and I can still see some reason why the Buckley one's been put back a little bit, but perhaps somebody can explain the two points I'm brought up, Chairman. Thank you, Captain Osborne. I particularly want to support you on the Long Buckley um, Cycle Park, because that's been going on for years. That's right, yeah. And that road is particularly dangerous, those who know it came from Dumption to Long Buckley. You've got the two bridges there with a snowfall path at all. Three. I talked about the small bridges to go over the. Yeah, there are three of them. Yeah, one, two, three. Yeah. Yeah. The Burgess. The Burgess, the Burgess. Yeah. And that's, and that's, again, I don't understand why it's been pulled back here, so maybe the officer can explain why it's been pulled back. Chairman, I mean, first thing I would say, I think, is the programme is somewhat fluid. What we're trying to do is provide a sensible, forward view, but things can change. And if circumstances change, it's perfectly possible for either or both of these to come forward again. So it isn't the council saying this is the definitive position for all time. Um, second thing is, it's very welcome that a lot of people are also engaged in that issue. Yeah. Um, in terms of the Lombard Cycle Track, partly it's simply a question of juggling what's available. The Bronson Cycle Track is proceeding quite well, slower than light, but nonetheless, we're closer to a design solution and a set of outcomes for that than we are for Lombard. So pulling that forward and pushing not of your any sense in, in terms of what we can deliver in what order. Um, the other thing about Long Buckby is we need to dovetail that work with work with Highways England, and we are talking to them about crossing the A5 in a safe fashion, um, and also with the North Northeast Urban Extension, there being a relatively little point in sorting out three bridges if you then release people onto a, a dangerous crossing of the A5, for example. So all those factors have been in play in, in making these suggested changes that we're probably not going to be in a position to productively use that money on our market route, whereas we will on broad route. And in terms of the town of car parking, we do regular bi monthly monitoring of car parking take up. At present, there is capacity, it's not as free as it was, but there is still. And our monitoring suggests that even with the site one and five developments carried out, there still will be just enough capacity. And we're also working with our partners on the site three to see if so for all those reasons, it seems to be appropriate to suggest that at present. But as I said, it could be called forward again if the resources are there and if the need comes earlier than we anticipate.
Thank you, Simon. As far as it's recognised that the concerns in Lombok be about the safety of CEOs and about the requirement to have one at some stage, I think that would be appreciated. Just to come back on the first point, Chairman, if we could again consider Lombok, as, as Chris is saying, the Chairman is saying, as soon as possible, yeah. I mean, there have been, um, well, certainly one death there anyway, several smashes, bridges knocked down, okay, we're only talking about the cycleway, but we're talking people can't walk from the canal, people can't bike from the canal, people can't bike from Down Creek, people can't walk from Buckley Wharf and the other way around. It is so dangerous, it's unbelievable. So as soon as it's possible, uh, we, I would be grateful as, along with Chairman as a local member to get something done, especially by those three bridges. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chief Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chief Minister. Councillor Just um, one question, please, about the seat itself. Because yeah. um, I've realised that it's a lot of capital expenditure here, but it talks about infrastructure. Can you use the monies at all to help with rural bus services, subsidy, or anything like that? Sorry. Um, the simple answer is yes, um, but it must be linked to meeting the needs caused by development, not necessarily the same development that generates an amount of state. It's not like planning obligation, etc. But I mean, we may be a little bit of a creative about how we do it, but we must use the sale money to deal with the impacts of development in the round. Now, if it means that a bus service that we provide happens to pass through another village because that you know, we can't do anything else in a sense, and those villages benefit, well, all well and good, but we have to use the money for the purpose of dealing with the impact. Um, it's just that uh, with all the uh, bus services that are being cut of late, I'm probably going to be criticised for saying this, but for me, priority would be retaining the bus services as opposed to cycling. The other thing is, um, Bob Buckley's gone on about safety. I hear what you're saying about bringing forward the programme for Broadstone, but for me, safety comes first over bringing forward something that we can deliver quicker. So I would be uh, in favour of. You know, if we're talking deaths here, but progressing the longer, the longer we work. That's going to be open. It's been wasted a long time anyway. Like, I realise you've got to do it the right order. Thanks for coming. Yes, that's over to you. Of course, absolutely right. Councillor Rebel. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm quite surprised actually about the 39,000 for the purpose of ensuring seal due to be collected because I can remember when I was back on corporate governance about three, probably around three, could be four years ago, um, it was flagged up then that we weren't doing such a great job of making sure we collected all the S106 in time. And, you know, even to the point that it come about that that bit of artwork on the roundabout by McDonald's, um, I think they had something like seven years to collect it, and we got in just in the last month. Um, so I thought that it was flagged up then that we needed a much more robust system for timings to be flagged up. So I'm quite surprised that that's, you know, that robust system isn't already in place when it's flagged up all that time ago. Um, I'm quite surprised also that there's no 123 list update um, as we will be updating that because um, I quite agree with um, Councillor Osborne that there may be different priorities going on and it was my friend who was involved in that accident um, a few weeks ago along that road. Um, and we all know how dangerous it is, and it is a vital link. You know, that is our only link to the train station, and it's horrendous driving along there, let alone if you've got to try and walk or cycle. So I would think that that would be one of our priority spends. And I also agree um, that town centre parking, I mean, I don't know when you carry out these, but when I go into town, often I find nowhere to park, and the only place you may find to park is Tesco, but obviously that is restricted. And again, like Councillor Paul said, um, with all these multiple occupancies um, coming about, I would think that it's more vital to move that one up the list. So maybe we should look at doing our one, two, three list <coughs> and go back to prioritising. Thanks, Councillor Randall. I mean, also, I noticed the comments about the long but do you want to comment on the first part, Councillor Randall? I, I think my comment about just the clarity on that, but start with the one, two, three list. The 123 list, the council's appropriate to try and set, set that on a fairly solid, unchanging basis, not, you know, casting stones forever. 
but so there's clarity and developers don't then get worried about what's called double dipping. And the one, two, three list isn't being supposed to be changed, but council can, within the priorities of that one, two, list, change its priorities in the SIL program, which is very much on the discussion tonight. And we've heard what members have said about both parking and about the, the, the non bucket link. I think we'll think further about what might be done on those. Um, in terms of planning obligations, I, I know my colleague from Inchman will want to comment on that, um, but this specifically is about SIL, which wouldn't have been the subject of that audit. Yeah. Um, certainly I can give members complete reassurance about the, we've had up-to-date audits, and over many years, we've got very good um, monitoring and compliance in place for Section 106. We've got a, an officer who's been coordinated in that since we did a very, very thorough um, job on that about five years ago now. And there are no, we are not missing Section 106 payments. That is very much uh, on the ball, compliant. It's all, it's all working as it should be. I can also um, confirm that when we're talking about SIL compliance, um, for example, an applicant may um, have got a self-build exemption and by somebody being able to go out and do a tour of the district and if they haven't actually met with the criteria and given, you know, um, followed the rules and given us contact prior to commencing, they lose their exemption and by being proactive and going out and checking when some <coughs> supplements go into the, the places that have been recently authorised in the district, that's how we can pick up. Because actually, if people aren't complying with the rules around the exemption for their new properties, then we will be bidding them and getting that money. That's what this um, project is about. Uh, Director Assistant Council Council Randall. Uh, Councillor Button. Thank you, Chair. Can I just ask uh, some clarification on what's meant by charities and commercial activity? Because mm. I don't quite understand that statement. Yeah. Okay, so, okay. The civil regulation is made of charitable de development by a charity for its charitable purposes automatically exempt. So if you are, let's see for example, um, a, a charity that, that does um, water sports, uh, water sport development, and you build a water sports facility, that is exempt by operational regulations. The regulation then say a local authority can choose to allow a charity which does a commercial development which it will take profit from and use for its charitable purposes also to be exempt. And if you wish to offer that additional exemption, you have to choose to do so. Now the recommendation is we do not choose to do so because those developments generate the same impact as development carried out by any other uh, developer and therefore it's sort of reasonable and balanced to treat them in the same way. But given the point you just made, is any return made by a charity that is not for profit is then used to further its charitable aims. I'm not quite sure why we would wish to penalise charities from coming here and providing facilities where the surplus generated annually would then be used onwards for their charitable purposes. Chairman, the, um, I mean, it clearly is a choice council has. The difficulty you've got is there was a local impact and a charity which may offer no local benefit at all. Um, other than the employment of the people in that venue and other related activity that this area would benefit from and yet it's still providing the profit for its charitable aims. But if we help them to generate employment and so on, so in a sense you, you, you would definitely be arguing not want to have still the truth. But you're penalising a charity for choosing to invest here. That's the point I'm making. So why would a charity come and develop uh, activity, which you may choose to call commercial, but actually all charities are, operate on a not-for-profit basis, and their surplus has to be reinvested in their charitable objects? I think, um, if I, I think it might be helpful. If you were a housing developer or a housing association, and you happen to be set up as a charity, then if you are, if you adopt this discretion, then they, they will be able to sit, which is not this, which is hence the recommendation. If this local council wants to provide funding or support to a charity, it has a due process to doing that. Applying a blanket discretion through SIL is not necessarily the best way of doing it. I think I think it's a helpful um, 
clarification. But you're applying a blanket uh, no at the moment is the proposal without caveat, which is what you've just said. Um, Jim, we only have a choice, it's either a blanket yes or a blanket no. However, if the council does have a blanket no, as Maria says, it can use its grant policies to support charitable activity it considers worthwhile for the benefit of citizens. Thank you, Councillor Bunty. Interesting question. Uh, <coughs> Councillor Collins. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I just wanted to add my weight behind the cycle safety aspect of this. Uh, from all villages and the whole of Daventry as a whole, actually, it doesn't matter where the priority lies. I think we have to get that behind it because we've got a national event coming to Daventry. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. International event. Mm -hmm. International mm -hmm. event. Um, obviously, it's going to be televised. We're going to have all that support behind it. And what this means really is that once that's been done and launched and it's you know concluded, you are going to see a lot more children and adults taking up cycling and sport and going out on the roads. So everything we can do, I appreciate you've already put it high on the agenda. It's something you're not going to miss. But I think for those reasons, we should definitely put it up there with them. Thank you for those points, Councillor Collins. Thank you. Councillor Warren. Sorry, Councillor Wesley, my apologies. You got the same initials. I do apologise, Councillor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, um, I just want to add my concerns about town centre car parking. I'm, again, I'm not sure when the surveys are done, but I mean, I do know that there are serious problems at times with car parking. I myself have actually come up here and driven, and I know I've driven away, and I know my wife has driven away as well. If I'm doing it, other people are doing it, and that could have serious detriment to this town. Really, really serious. And I appreciate that at times there is car parking up here, but at peak times, then I don't think there is. So I'd just like to sort of say that, and that uh, the surveys aren't always aren't always exactly uh, aren't exactly the truth. They, they're just a moment in time, and it happens to happens to look right. So I, I, I urge us to look at that again. I also ask another question just um, <coughs> on page 57 because I'm just not quite, I just like to just know how you uh, understand it. This is the last one, the infrastructure <coughs> um, part of the table. What does that actually, I don't quite understand what that means, if I'm honest. What sort of sense of being? Well, infrastructure payments, does that mean that uh, it's uh, accepting infrastructure payments in lieu of cell payments? Mm. Is that what I'm saying? Like that? So, Chairman, yes. Mm. It's helpful to clarify. The regulations allow the council, if it has chosen to, to adopt this discretion, to accept payment from kind. So, to keep it simple, a developer might have an obligation to pay a million pounds in civil. They could instead say, we will build you this section of work. And provided the section of work isn't something they need to do anyway, as a planning condition or a planning obligation or so on, uh, and we can assess that it's a fair price for that section of the vehicles, then that would be an infrastructure. Thank you very much. I would consider. That's very helpful, sir. Thank you. Councillor Dills. Yeah, um, I was going to come in with Councillor Collins, but um, regarding uh, the fact that you spoke about the Women's Cycle Tour, one of the things that we want to gain from the Women's Cycle Tour is an increase in physical activity and an increase possibly in women's cycling. Um, now, this isn't just for the town, this is for the district. So I think from the point of view of cycle tracks, etc., the quicker we can show some return, because we're going to have the uh, cycle race, we then want to see some action from it and a follow-up on it. So I think there is a point there that we need to get on to things as quickly as we possibly can. Thank you, Steve. Councillor Hills. Uh, <coughs> Councillor Paul. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman. <coughs> uh, thank Councillor Bunting for asking um, my question um, regarding uh, uh, the discretionary charity relief, purely and simply because a number of uh, registered providers are going into the house building um, for sale market um, and the question has been answered adequately. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I am concerned with my <coughs> colleagues about parking in Daventry. However, if you go to places like Nuneaton where if you want to go shopping you have to walk. Not quite like Daventry where the 
car parks around your door. However, apart from that quite facetious remark, with the plans going forward for Site 1, Site 3, um, parking is being taken into consideration, Site 5 also, um, there is uh, parking provision there. So it's not uh, going to disappear into the background, it is being considered uh, really on a, on a, on a, I won't say a daily basis, but as, as plans move forward. Um, I do have um, concerns, um, and I think uh, Councillor Osborne mentioned planning. Um, at the moment, we're, we're sitting at planning meetings with a number of houses of multiple occupancy coming into the town centre. Um, and the um, <laughs> assumption that the people that are within these properties will not have any means of transport um, is absolutely ludicrous. Um, there are no parking provisions. Yes, they can get permits in town, etc., etc. But the more houses of multiple occupancy, the more parking permits, the less room there is for uh, those people that we want into the town to spend money. Um, the one, two, three, um, I think Simon has already said it is uh, flexible and uh, no doubt as the town council prepares their one, two, three list, I'm sure Councillor Randall will enjoy joining in that one there. Thank you. Thanks Councillor Paul. Um, I was going to just come back to you now, <coughs> Councillor James, if you want to sum up from those comments and observations. Mm -hmm. Quite good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no one tries to cycle the path between in Devonshire, in me since I, I ran away from Station Road Long Brooklyn when I was through there somewhere. And a dear old lady found me at the Burgess. Her name was Jane Sidwell. To my hobby, and my life, I suppose. I just would have liked to see my father. And, um, went to school with me. Uh, <laughs> to school with me, yeah. And I uh, ran away on a little, little bike with a couple of pedals on the front. Uh, and I went all the way down to the bed. That old lady's got a lot to answer for. I'm glad to share that, Captain James. Going back to the agenda, Scott. No, I've nothing further to add. Where she lives. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Captain Shepherd. Now, just a small one on Simon's figures. Parish share. Parish councils are positively salivating at these numbers. Can you help me? It's either 15 or 25. That's right, yes. I think they got a zero um, with a caveat, if there is not a neighbourhood plan in place, and there are certain other even more finicky bits, but stick to that, um, the 15% is capped by reference to a £100 index per existing house. So in a large parish, you probably wouldn't apply, um, but in a likely populated parish, the cap may bite uh, such that 15% is received. Um, uh, in your section parish share, uh, have you then identified the relevant parishes and applied 15 or 25? Chairman, for you. Um, at the moment, the, to be reasonably cautious from the point of view of BBC, we're pursuing 20 percent everywhere except where we know there is a general planning place, in which case we're pursuing 25. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, that, that's, that's where it becomes a, a, a little. Uh, with the parishes because I mean, Bowser, for example, has seen 609, okay, and that's 20%, it's not 15%, it's not 25%, it's 20%, right? No, I think it is 20%. Chairman, I, I apologize to the parishes if we've led them um, to, to expect more than they should. This is, it is a DBC perspective, it's trying to be cautious about what money DBC will receive and be able to, to allocate. Uh, and that's the reason for that, that there's something being expressed in that way. I think managing expectations are very important. Well, uh, yes, yeah. exactly. Through exactly. you, Chairman, rest assured, when the money is different twice a year, we're not using assumptions, it's very carefully calculated. Oh, I, I'm sure it will be. And I've already told about them, not to spend it. Very good at that, John, actually, very good, yes. Ever. Ever. Thank you, Steve. Right, going back to the recommendations before you, there's obviously three. The third one, in particular, stops on additional planning fee, income, 
arise in full stop, and the rest of the sentence is taken out. And also, I think officers have noted all the comments tonight about observations made, and those will have to come forward. And these recommendations go to Council for uh, to be agreed in May, so we might have some further feedback on it. Thanks. Not saying, but the comments have been noted, obviously, about certain aspects. Are you happy to set those three recommendations? We've got to environment issues now. It's Councillor Guildford proposed joint venture with Morse. Thank you, Chair. Um, the report before you seeks approval to enter into a joint venture with Norse Commercial Services Limited for the delivery of environmental services from the end of the current environmental services contract on the 3rd of June 2018. I have brought several reports to both strategy and full council over the past year in connection with what service to put in place for when the current contract ends, resulting in council in February 2017 giving approval in principle for a joint venture with North. Because of the timings of the meetings, authority was delegated to strategy group to approve the terms of the JV and associated arrangements. This report sets out the proposed arrangements, including how the depot would be approached. Section 4.1 and 4.2 of the report details the Norse joint venture and service overview, which has not changed much from the form that, that has been presented before or from what was explained at the very successful members' training session. Section 4.3 is the new information that I should highlight and details the terms of the arrangement. As detailed legal work continues, therefore, minor changes to the outline listed may emerge, but the key terms are listed in 4.3, which I highlight. One, the JV would be 80% owned by Norse and 20% by the Council, but profit will be taken equally. Any losses will be taken by Norse. Provisions in the shareholders' agreement require that any change to the articles requires the consent of the Council. This, in effect, is to give the Council a much greater level of control than is implied by its minority shareholders. The company would have five directors, two appointed by Norse and two appointed from the council and the company's operational director, managing director, which would be a joint appointment, again allowing us some control. No decision of the JV's board could be taken unless at least one director appointed by each Norse and council voted in favour of it. And there all, would also be a liaison board consisting of both um, the joint venture and DDC representatives. While strictly this would be a decision for council each year, I've made it very clear that it's expected that the Daventry JV liaison board would have cross-party representation. The term would initially be for 10 years, with the option of any number of extensions of any length agreed by both parties. Both Norse and the Council would have the option of termination, terminating it at 24 months notice at any time after the first five years. And there may well be some minor changes to the detail, but it is expected these will remain a fair reflection of the arrangement. Overall, it is considered that these are a fair and balanced set of proposals which embody the intention that the joint venture would be like having an in-house service but with the benefits of a more commercial approach and the knowledge of the Norse group. The risks are listed in section 4.4. Overall, it is considered that the proposed arrangement put in place would allow the council to sensibly manage these risks identified. Section 4.5 of the report details the depot options. Options for providing a wholly new facility have been explored, but have been advised that a new depot is not the route to take. Therefore, options to refurbish and partly develop the current contract house site and adjoining space are being put in place. Arrangements for implementation remain essentially as set out in the February 2017 strategy report. It is proposed that myself as the environmental portfolio holder 
and the chief executive should be appointed as directors of the joint venture. 4.7 of the report details contingency arrangements and section 5 of the report lists the implications. In conclusion, I ask that you resolve the recommendations before you. However, we have identified that in order to ensure the depot is ready for occupation, certain works will need to be ordered soon, before the business plan for the depot enhancements can be taken to council, which will be July at the earliest. Normally, we can only spend up to 75000 prior to the business plan approval. So, however, I would like to amend recommendation 3 and add at the end up to 150,000 may be committed prior to the business plan approval in order that we can get these works commenced. It's, uh, we're on a very tight schedule, as you know, and we need to instruct works ASAP. Thank you, Councillor Gilford. That's why these are result items tonight, not recommendations. And you can see there also some dedication there as a very required. So we kick off. Councillor Bunty. Thank you, Chair. Um, just in my role as Chair of Corporate Governance, yeah. and we met last night, and a, a couple of things uh, reflected on that meeting, reading the recommendations. Whilst generally very supportive of the paper as a whole, so no criticism there, and I think it's, it's well laid out from what I've just read. Um, the query is, is about the role of the directors and uh, the proposal therein. And it says ineligible for some reason or unsuitable, first of all. I think we need to be slightly more clear in the recommendation that clearly anybody that their council appoints has to meet company laws requirements and they're very specific about who is eligible or ineligible to stand as a director. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the first point. I think then we need to be a little bit more dis uh, determined about what do we mean by ineligible or unsuitable. Um, do we just mean that they're ineligible in law to stand as a director or Question mark. Further, the, one of the other points that came up in the uh, committee last night was about the skills, experience and knowledge of members that are appointed to subsidiary boards and whether they have the relevant skills to be able to act as a director, which of course when they're in the room they are a director of the joint venture company, right. not a member of the right. council, not a representative or an elected person, but they have to discharge the duties of a director appropriately in line with what is expected upon of them. And then, and, and I, so I think there's a bit of um, grey in the words ineligible or unsuitable. Uh, and I also think that as a matter of course, council should now think about the training and development it gives to members that it seeks to appoint to subsidiary boards so that they are made aware of their requirements, duties and role as a, as a director in law. Well, thank you for that. I mean, that last point is a fair point, actually. That's something you can sort of look at in terms of setting up a training session for members. I think the way I read it, uh, Council Bunting, was when I read that second recommendation is, I think it's just a caveat, isn't it, in case, unless you're, you're specifically saying two people there, two executives in the environment portfolio holder, is there any reason why they couldn't do it? That's just a caveat to say they couldn't do it, and someone else would have to do it. That's how I read it. Sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry, Chairman. It, it, um, it's probably helpful just to comment. The way it's intended to work, I think reflects what Corporate Governance Committee has identified. Ineligible means literally ineligible, not able by reason of law to be a director. Maybe in an undischarged background, for example. Um, um, unsuitable is designed to cover the kinds of issues that have been identified, whether someone has the right skill set to properly fulfill that role. And then obviously you've got to decline to say, get up, but they don't want to do it, then so be it. Well, yeah, yeah. <coughs> I entirely understand uh, those points. Um, however, uh, and indeed you're writing, you're proposing to write something here that's going to end your for may maybe a decade or more. So I can see the reason for wanting to have something in writing. So that at the next, when, when Joe Clifford eventually retires, we've got a formula for appointing a, 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 a successor. But, um, if it's in fact ex officio, if in fact the environment portfolio holder is ex officio director, then whenever we're appointing the environment portfolio holder, we're appointing the environment portfolio holder and 
and Director of North at the same time. So the person, by definition, who is, who is going to be appointed the environment portfolio holder in this council each May, uh, we would have to be sure that that person is capable of doing those two jobs. Uh, and I think we can be reasonably confident that when we appoint the chief executive, is uh, capable of doing those two jobs in the same fashion. So, I mean, you're not, you're not going to suggest that the, 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 the caveat uh, in paragraph two here uh, is to apply, is, is there because of uh, the chief executive is, is a nominee. I mean, it's not it's quite ludicrous. So, I, I, just, I just mentioned the suggestion that we don't actually need it, we don't actually need the words after unless. Uh, we could simply stop, full stop after chief executive. Um, that's my first point. And the, sec the second point is it was a slightly different one. The delays on board. Uh, presumably, there's going to be a uh, term, terms of reference of the, as one of the documents of the liaison board. And presumably, it's going to look like a sort of overview committee, a sort of client centered overview committee. Is that, is that broadly right? Better. Yes, that's probably right. Yes. Yeah. So more than merit, really, on that. You know, not not just two, not just one or two, but possibly even three or four people. Yeah. But anyway, that, 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 that's, that's to be discussed. Okay. But there, there, there will be a, there will be a document in terms of reference of that on the on board. Um, okay. Well, getting back to Chris Bunting's point. Chris um, Bunting. <laughs> Unless you're Chris as well. I often get called things. No, I'm back. It's one of the nicest. <laughs> I'm back. I'm back. Um, I mean, I'm, really, that matter for the draftsman, and Simon, you, you, you drafted this particularly. So, you know, how, how uh, important do you think those words are, starting with unless? Well, I don't see the problem with that. It's, just, it's unlikely to happen, isn't it? But if it does happen, in the words, it's clarify what would happen if that's the case. I'm not saying it's likely to happen, it's just that it does happen. I don't see a problem personally, for example. Yeah, I, 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 that's Chairman, that was the point. I mean, he, as Council Chairman has rightly said, this is an array of the design for review of potentially many decades. No. And therefore, it was seeking to give Council just a little bit of wriggle room if something arose, perhaps yeah, we can't see it, that needed to be addressed. I'm not talking about the current holders of those positions. <laughs> <laughs> not to my knowledge, anyway. <laughs> No comment. Okay, no comment. Councillor Wesley. Thank you, Chair. Um, actually, I think most of my points have been covered, and, and I do agree. I did have concerns about paragraph two. I didn't think it read uh, quite correctly. And I also think it's important that that replacement person, if required, and I understand this is contingency, and I understand why we're putting it in there, but that person should, I believe, should also be an elected member. And I don't think that that says it in there either. Well, the very important thing on um, because he says replacing them as a direct as a board director. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. You understand what I was saying? Yeah. Yeah. You get that? Mm -hmm. I do, Chairman. I was just trying to think about some words that would capture it without making yeah. this too verbose. Member yeah. appointment. Member appointment. Member appointment. I think so. I think it should be. Yeah. I think that's the yeah. member. Is that the word? Mm -hmm. Well, could, yeah. could it be like that? I was going to suggest a like for like point. That's, I think, what's being requested. Yeah. Member for member, officer for yeah, officer. Yeah, that's a fair point. That's a good point. Yes, yeah. yeah. well, thank you. Yes, so do you want to proceed the debate here? I think it's important. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Thank you. Hi. Councillor Paul. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I need a couple of things. Um, which can be ironed out later. Um, on page 62, second paragraph from the bottom, administration for burial records and funerals, uh, waste recycling and education uh, matters will be dealt with directly by the council staff. That I welcome wholeheartedly. I would not want that uh, part to go out of this building or out of the confines of the different <coughs> council to a third party. Um, page 64, um, item 7, there will be a fixed price for disposing of recyclers for five years. Um, knowing the volatile market of recyclers, I think that's uh, um, optimistic to put it in there for five years. However, and then on page 63, 4, um, I welcome the idea that uh, 
uh, members uh, and officers, and uh, we would have a cross-party uh, representation of members. Um, I like the idea of a cross-party uh, uh, group as opposed to all of the ruling party, as it were. That's it, Chairman. Thank you. That last point is very important. This is our biggest service, effectively, in our district. Yeah. Uh, so obviously a high risk, it's a high risk, many of you may have this, and Council Guild has uh, done a very good job of meeting this process so far. So I'm very delighted that uh, Council Guild has been very keen to make sure it's a cross-party and uh, that we can have things move forward. And uh, yeah, and one of whom I know the other Wendy Mandel, Council Mandel, who had a particular interest in this subject, I think. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it, actually. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, just reading through, I mean, obviously I'm very happy to have um, Councillor Guildford um, in this current role. Um, obviously, she's very knowledgeable in, you know, employment before. Um, you know, so I'm very comfortable with that. I would be very uncomfortable if she left. I mean, you know, it would worry me about having somebody with um, less experience. Maybe in the role may not always be the best person, you know, with the knowledge that's, you know. Um, preparation of burial plots, I mean, Councillor Guildford knows we've had a lot of issues with that, so I'm hoping that that's going to be um, a lot better. Um, picking up from Councillor Paul's point on page 63, it does say um, that the portfolio holder is clear that it is expected that she would like cross-party representation, but then on 69, it says um, the liaison board is not subject to formal political balance requirements, but it is assumed. I would like it written more robustly in there that actually, you know, if there was um, a mix in the council, I mean, it might be that it's always going to be, it might be one party at one time, but if there is a cross, that I would like it written in there that, that it would be cross party. Um, so I would like that written in. Um, and the only other bit was on 5.6 on page 59 um, about handling the councillor's customer relation management system. Um, whether we did it or whether they did it, or how it was done. I mean, obviously we all know that um, in the beginning of the last contract, um, the complaints were coming in thick and fast, um, and it cost this council money to put extra staff in place to deal with that. And obviously we would hope that that wouldn't come to fruition again. Um, and the only other bit in there I was looking at was on page 65, 1.5, and it does say that JV, the JV does not form as expected um, arrangements including to the age of the board, you know, and hopefully wouldn't, things wouldn't appear. But I've got something robustly in there that, you know, we've heard good things about this company, um, you know, and hopefully things will go really, really well, but we don't ever want to be in the same situation that we've been in under this contract. That if things do go well, we just put it, you know, they just get... Um, um, well, it's not a fine, but you know things are put in place. But we just—it didn't improve the service. It doesn't matter what we were deducting from the service. You know, it didn't improve, and we never want to go down that route again. So, um, hopefully, you know, it'll be a lot tied to this time. Okay, thank you first of all for endorsing my portfolio. That's very good. So that's nice to know, John. You're the value of this leader. That's good. And I also want to say, actually, Wendy, that I like to think of whichever administration is in charge here. They'll yeah, make sure, because we can't force it, because it's not actually a formal political balance requirement, that the spirit of the actual committee will be made up on, on, with all parties involved. I think that's what we're saying on political balance. So we're kicking off on that basis, and I'd like to think that will continue thereafter. I'll let Joe come back on those points. Is that okay, Jen? Yeah, that's okay. Uh, this is Councillor Omax, next. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Omax, Thank you, Chairman, for allowing me to speak. I'm a member of the committee. I first of all say that um, I do welcome um, the, su the suggestion and proposal that there should be cross-party representation. I think on a, an issue quite as important as this to the public, it, it's very important that uh, all parties should be represented on the liaison group. Uh, what I wanted to ask about was um, page 62, service overview. Pay equipment inspections. In a previous life, I was the National Playing Fields Association's uh, representative in Northamptonshire. 
and uh, I've been involved over the years in many, many playgrounds throughout the uh, county uh, from all sorts of aspects of it. Um, I wanted some assurance that in fact these <coughs> inspections would be undertaken by people, that we would know that they were undertaken by people who had got relevant experience and training and that in fact they were conducted at appropriate intervals and having made the inspections that the maintenance and replacement of uh, playground equipment would actually be communicated to the council expeditiously. The reason I ask this is because when I chaired the um, scrutiny panel, task panel, uh, on SML, we did look at the play, the, the playing fields within the town, <coughs> and uh, at the same time we, we looked at uh, the play equipment, and some of it was in a dire state, and obviously had not been uh, properly looked at and inspected by enterprise as it, as it was then. Um, mm. Now, I, I would like some sort of reassurance that in fact, we're going to be looking at requiring um, inspections to be in line with MPFA uh, guidelines and requirements. Thank you, Steve, Councillor Evans. So, come back a minute on that point, please, Councillor Gilby. Councillor Borsley, quickly. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Randall brought up a point regarding um, uh, the CRM system uh, back in the day um, when we went with uh, Enterprise, um, our CRM system, yes, was, uh, I won't say overloaded, it, it, it peaked and spiked for about seven to ten days, but then you would expect that of any system being embedded. Um, after that seven to ten day period, um, our call centre staff and the uh, CRM system at the time was able to cope. Thank you, Councillor. As the portfolio holder at that time, I can assure you, Councillor Randall. Thank you, Councillor Paul. Councillor Gilbert. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for all the uh, compliments that have been flying about. Much appreciated. Um, I think what we, I, I think it's the same answer for all these questions tonight, in that this is a completely different business model than what we have at the moment. It's something where we are going to be engaged as partners, something where we will have some influence, and um, I think we've already engaged in a good working relationship that's been proven in that we've got this far with officers at North. So um, nothing can be guaranteed, but I have every option that you know, this will be a better contract going forward. I will add a caveat though, in that we're implementing a brand new service. So at the beginning of the contract, we are going to get an increase in telephone calls, an increase in inquiries, but I'm sure that all will be planned for as part of the implementation process. So, um, yes, um, because we have more control, then, you know, at the liaison board, we can ask for uh, certain qualifications, but I'm, thought, I'm sure they will be asked for anyway. And um, your comments regarding very lots and education, yes, those um, will be retained. So, um, and then in connection with the um, qualifications, uh, yes, we've stressed that um, uh, an MP would have the suitable qualifications, and I take on board what you're saying, but one would hope that a portfolio holder would also have, have to have certain skills to reach this level as well. Yeah. So um, I think it's very positive what we're going forward with. Um, I've talked about a different model. You know, we're already engaging with parish councils and uh, town Council on church yards and little picking going forward. So I am very optimistic about the uh, contract. Thank you, Councillor Gilbert. Yeah. And uh, can I just say, I think it's important to say there's been great cross party engagement in this whole process, and that should be recognised. 
And I think it's been a very positive engagement in terms of all these issues that have been raised over a period of time, and we're now coming to the end game. And of course, the issue that's raised earlier about the potentially new site, the real difficulty there is the time frame. We've only got a, a year in June, and that's not that far now, it's 14 months away, really, the beginning of June as well. So the reality is, we, this is the best we've got, really. And I think it's good that we've also had the design at the planet, so we hope we can move forward. So you've got the three resolved items there, which are decisions we're taking today. And you want to add that bit in the back? I'll get the amendment. It's worded, thank you. Chairman, I, I would well, item three. suggest at the end of item two, or two sorry. So, sorry, item three is the one that I was in this moment, right, yeah. in response to Councillor Weathers. Yeah. After the words with the leader, if we add comma such that, I'll read my own writing here, yeah. such that one appointed is a member and one is an officer. Yeah. There's always one member, one officer. Are you happy with that? Are oh, we happy to uh, agree that resolve three items? Three, three, three. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Guildford. Thank you. Move on to the last item tonight community culture and measure issues, much more primary schools, revisions to the district plan, Councillor Hills. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, what we're talking about here is much more school than the revisions to the business plan. Um, basically, then, as you have before you four recommendations. Now, I do not propose to go through them all, because you will have, no doubt, and read them. However, I would refer you to recommendation number two, that the capital programme of the school be reduced from 5.038 million to 4.537 million, with 0.060 million in the year 16-17, and 4.38 million in 17-18. This has come about by a small reduction in size and a reduction in the school places requirement. Uh, 4.3 refers to this. Although there is a slight reduction, there is still flexibility that if in the event more school places were required, more than were as estimated, then the school could move into the nursery area with a nursery elsewhere. So it does cater for that. Now, we know there's been delays. Originally, completion was September 2017. We're now looking to September 2018. But the plateau has now been delivered, and we need to move forward. I would refer you to 4.10 regarding possible emergency. And I would say this, that the school is now part of Hill Ward, which is my ward. And I'm sure that my fellow ward councillors will agree that as some young families have already moved into the estate because of the school, the sooner this is completed, the better. We as a council need to confirm our intent to get this moving, and I will ask you all to support these revisions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Steve, Councillor Hills, and Councillor Paul. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I welcome the report uh, put forward by. Uh, Councillor Hills, yet again, here we are, DDC being the, uh, the champion for education um, in this area, in the county. You know, there's, there's none better than us for a champion education. Um, I think Wendy Randall even said that in her leaflet. Um, however, a um, couple of things. Um, I'm probably less polite than others. Um, <coughs> probably less polite than officers when they write a report and they talk about Crest Nicholson. And we are where we are because of Crest Nicholson dragging their heels. And for no other reason, they were dragging their heels. Um, I personally am not happy uh, about that and I've now viewed or aired my views, so that's fine. Um, three metres um, is the plateau. Um, three metres, holy moly, I mean, that's, that's ten feet. I mean, surely that should um, uh, keep out any flood or probably even Noah's up. But uh, I really welcome this uh, chairman and uh, as I say, but for Crash Nicholson, it could have been built by now almost. Thank you, Councillor Paul. Any other comments or observations? 
I've just shown you all this money. We are where we are. Um, yes, as, as I said, there's been delays that we can't dwell on what has happened in the past. What we've got to do is look forward to moving it forward, yeah. getting the completion date in September, uh, get it open properly on that date. Thank you. I don't want to reassure members that a lot goes on behind the scenes, which they won't be aware of, when we had these blockages or hold ups. Uh, this council does pull its weight, push its weight very heavily actually to try and make things happen. We've got a long track record of that. These things don't just happen just by chance. So this is another example where actually we have got there in the end and I welcome that as well. Councillor Randall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only just a quick observation that I actually hope that the projected numbers are correct. Um, and it, you know, obviously County Council has expressed on it ease um, about this proposed approach. Um, and it, it always amazes me actually how they work out how many children and at what age you're going to move into what houses because you know you could have a couple living in a five bedroom house or you could have one with seven kids living in a five bedroom house so you know all ages so it always amazes me and I just you know I just hope that we've got it right. Thank you Mr. Councillor Adam, Councillor Wesley. Yeah I just want to express concerns about that as well I think um, I think virtually I mean, the new school at Ashby Fields um, was seen that folks and girls had to be expanded almost immediately or very, very quickly. And, uh, and it does worry me that even before we start, we're looking at uh, less with more and more, it's just more and more kids in the town, because you know, it's just more and more people in the town. Um, we have everyone all over the place. So I know, I know the school is designed for, for that state, but we have to recognise the fact that people are being. Um, people being um, moved around the, the town to various different schools and various different parts of it and uh, there are pinch points at various points around that and uh, so it does concern me that we're, we're restricting, it's like we're cutting back on something that we, uh, that we actually, in my view, probably already need or will do by the time it, uh, by the time it comes to fruition. Yeah, it's frustrating because actually we're not the education authorities, you'd be aware. Yeah. And we, we actually, we actually, we actually share an education form in which actually involves all partners, including the county council, and we have done for some time now to make sure we do get the right back in the country. So I do recognise some things better. But we are, we are trying to influence this all the time, Mark. It's a serious point because actually there's more, more there's thousands more houses going to be built in Dumpton in many years ahead. So we've got a lot long term as well as short term. So we're very aware of that and we're doing our very best to influence that agenda. Councillor Paul. Chairman, if I may come back, um, the reason for the expansion of Ashby Field School and the expansion of the Grange, um, purely and simply the catchment area for both those schools included Middlemore. Had the County Council built that school on Middlemore that they promised to do, then those schools wouldn't have needed to be expanded. The other side of the coin, Chairman, is that um, going forward, when the Micklewell um, uh, uh, estate is built, then there will be another primary school um, adjacent to Middlemore. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Paul. Any more comments or Councillor Hills? I'd just like to say, yes, I understand. Projections are projections. They can never be 100% accurate, and I, I think they never will. But as I stated earlier, there is flexibility built into this plan, Agreed. so that enables us to have some comfort from that. And I was going to mention, but Councillor Paul brought me to it, that there will be another school on the Mick World Development. So I think that we are moving forward in education, and as a district, we are to the forefront in what we do in that aspect. Thank you, Mr. Councillor. We've got four recommendations committee. Are you happy to agree with them all? Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.